Welcome to the weekly panel discussions here at the Iowa City Public Library where we bring together the talented writers of the International Writing Program every fall to address subjects of continuing interest. Today's panel, uh, just to, by way of thanks, first to Susan Craig, Beth Fisher, and their colleagues here at the Iowa City Public Library who make this space available to us, and to Downing Thomas, Dean of International Programs, who makes the pizza in the back of the room available to us. For those watching at home, uh, you can find out more about the writer's bibliographies, their work, and presentations uh, on the IWP website, which is iwp.uiowa.edu. You'll also find a full schedule of our public events, which this fall seemed to number around 160, all free, all open to the public. That's why my staff is so tired. And that's why we're going to have a guest moderator today. That's not exactly why, but that's, <laughs> but it is part of the makeup. And I'm really thrilled to introduce, to welcome to the lectern, Lauren Haldeman, who is the author of two dazzling collections of poems. She herself is a performer. She does things with uh, digital storytelling, with puppets, with art. She is uh, multi-talented, and she's also the editor of the Virtual Writing University website. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Haldeman. Thanks, Chris. And thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this panel. It involves many things that I think are interesting and future forward. And um, what I will do is start by introducing our panelists and we will hear from them, them and then at the end we will take some questions. I will start by introducing Salah Badis of Algeria is a founding member of NAFA magazine a journalist and music editor, and a musical and cultural researcher for print and radio. Salah's first poetry volume, Ship Weariness, was published in 2016. His poems and essays have been translated into English, French, and Turkish. He participates courtesy of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US State Department. Our next panelist is Ivo Peizuazwili of Georgia, his work is best known for the humor through which he tells stories about contemporary life. He's the author of two story collections. Most recently, he was part of the anthology, The Book of Tbilisi. In addition to his prose, Ivo uh, is a filmmaker who has written and directed a number of short films, animated series, and TV dramas. Of his many awards, he was most recently named best nominee for the Tsin Sinan Dali Best Prose Prize. His participation was made possible by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US State Department. Third, we have Tiaxing Chai. He is from China and he is a professor of mathematics at Zhejiang University. Chai has authored over 30 books of poetry, essays, collections of photographs, autobiographies, and academic work on number theory. Uh, he has published books including Every Cloud Has Its Own Name and Antologia Poetica, and has published three books in English and two in Spanish. He is a translator and editor of several poetry anthologies, and he is the winner of the 2013 Naji Naman Poetry Award in Beirut and the 2017 National Award of Science and Technology for his book of essays titled Mathematical Legends. His participation is made possible by the Paul and Walling Engel Fund. And finally, we have Bejan Mathur. Her work is characterized by concrete engagement with the struggles of her people while maintaining a mysticism and mythology within her own work. A Turkish poet and a nonfiction writer of Kurdish descent, Mathur has nine books of poetry and one book of nonfiction. Her poetry collection, How Abraham Abandoned Me, was selected as Best Translation of the Year in 2012, and uh, that was selected by the Poetry Society. Maitre's well-awarded prose and poetry has been translated into 24 languages, including English and Chinese, and her participation is made possible courtesy of an anonymous grant. Salah, would you like to start us off? And we'll just move 
right down the table. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks for Lee Marshall to work with us on the texts. So, <clears throat> the title of my text is Congratulations, a very nice cover. In a book of correspondence between the great Japanese writers, Yasunari Kawabata and Yukio Mishima, I discovered new information about how writers, even the greatest ones, can ask for attention and in doing so, expose themselves. As a writer, I favor Kawabata over Mishima, but I found out that my favorite writer asked, asked his disciple to write a letter from the members of PEN, of, of PEN Japan to the Swedish Academy in order to endorse Kawabata's no, nomination for the Nobel. And in another letter, he asked for the address of Mishima's English translator. Kawabata is not the first nor the last to be brazenly opportunistic. I can name dozens of great writers who self-promoted in the same way. In fact, since Kawabata's time, self-promotion has become stupider and more explicit. <laughs> After the Arab Spring in 2011, people discovered a whole generation of writers and artists who lived for years in the shadows. These people started using social media not only for riots and manifestos, but also for the promotion of their work. This was especially the case in countries where there was not strong literary or art market. I'm talking about the Arab work. Word. I remember a post made by the brilliant Tunisian novelist Ayman Debussy after he published his first novel, Black Erection. It's not translated to English. Which read, I don't believe that Facebook or any other platform is a bad tool for Arab writers. Don't accuse people who promote their work via their accounts. We don't have literary agents, nor strong publishing economy. Nobody will promote our work. At least we can use our accounts to announce some events and receive reactions from the prob probable reader. I found the reasoning behind Ayman's post to be fair, especially since he is such a quiet and talented writer. But after he made this post, I witnessed hundreds of writers and artists becoming influencers and playing in the territory of the show, or what we can call La Société du Spectacle, the society of show. Those writers will post a paragraph to social media with, this, with, with the caption, this is the last paragraph of my next novel, or I finished the first part of my book, self-promoting with posts about their work in progress. They would receive the same comment 2,000 times, Mabrok, Mabrok, which means congratulations. And if they publish the cover online, I love book covers, by the way, and I publish mine, they receive, Congratulations, what a beautiful cover, even if it is an ugly one. <laughs> On one hand, all of, all of it has become a boring game about staying relevant and staying in the game and the virtual lights of the social media, which are very small, by the way. As the Algerian influencers on Snapchat and Instagram who have two million followers and who keep posting which with each photo the same caption, stay in touch, my dears, the new is coming. We can read in Arabic, On the other hand, there are really good poets who publish, not just poets, even the short story writers, because I'm writing short stories now, <laughs> who publish their poems directly on Facebook, and after a few months, they collect all these post poems or fragments of poems, and they edit them together in order to publish a book. They say that they wrote these poems directly on their phones. I write many poems and fragments on Facebook, but I use the only for me post function when I do. I don't feel the need to share raw writing with my friends. Therefore, I just use the private post as a notebook when I don't have one on me. I purposely separate my poetry posts from the satiric posts and anecdotes I write publicly to comment on current events to joke about some stupid public personalities or to write a diary, as I'm doing with my trips here in the US. Because I believe that the post is an independent genre with its own history that began more than a decade ago with blog posts. Up until this point, I've been indulging in some digital literary word gossips. The crucial idea for me here is how to control my use of social media on daily basis. 
Before coming to Iowa City, I told myself that I need to deactivate all my accounts so that I can focus on my writing. But I certainly have not done this for many reasons, because there is always a reason. Deactivating your Facebook account has become the eternal promise, promise of the modern man. And as a writer and translator, that platform in my daily small, is my daily small evil. How do I avoid using Messenger? How do I avoid the other eternal promise of refreshing the timeline? <laughs> trying to always be connected, always here, trying to not miss the thing. The promise of the of supreme capitalism, to quote Haitham al Wardani's Book of Sleep, it's an Egyptian writer. Turn the economy of production, I'm talking about the supreme capitalism, turn the economy of production into an economy of consciousness where any other activity beside connecting, being connected, is a black hole and an appreciate this connection. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next we'll have Eva. I need some music here, sorry. So, uh, when I first received the topic of this, uh, panel, I had a like, couple of ideas and I wrote a couple of versions of my text and, I, and then I realized that it was a little stupid and I was a little depressed and one day I was walking on the street and I saw the rainbow over the church and white pigeon and then I realized that every answer is in the Bible. So now, now reading from the book of the Matthew. <coughs> yes. Blessed are the writers who have a special pen to give autographs. Blessed are the writers who Google their name at least once and months. A blessed are writers who biography add on the pages of Wikipedia. Blessed are the writers who have more questions than answers, for truly, I say to you, there is a kingdom of heaven. <laughs> blessed are those who hunger and thirst for literature, for they shall be satisfied with the manna from the heaven, Pulitzers and Bookers. Blessed are the publishers who give the writers who have not been blessed yet the, pro the prospect of a being blessing, the prospect of a blessing. And when they publish a book, they put it into not a bookshelf, bookshelf, but on Amazon, for it to enlighten those who have not been blessed, to educate them and illuminate their past. Blessed are those who think that, that good writers must be a good person and bad writer must be a bad person. <laughs> blessed are average writers, for they shall receive the mercy. <laughs> blessed are the poets, you are the light of the world, a city set on the hill cannot be hidden. Matthew 6. Uh, beware of reading a book before of other people in order to be acknowledged by them. Uh, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Those when you finish uh, reading a book sound no trumpet before you as a hypocrite do on Facebook and other social networks that they may be praised by others. <laughs> Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And when you read, do not be like... Uh, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to take beautiful photos of book, apply a filter and post them on the Instagram, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their rewards. But when you read, go into your room and shut the door and delight in the blessed writer. And the blessed writer who sees in the secret will reward you openly. And when you meet the writer, do not heap up empty prizes and as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your favorite writer. Uh, do not be like them, for your favorite writer knows what you need before you ask him. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about the life, what you will eat or what you will drink, for we have a free pizza and slightly warm <laughs> soda mix. <laughs> Amen. Title is a bit serious compared to him. <laughs> I write uh, poetry because I am uh, curious. I write essays because I am I have questions, and this sentence, in fact, is an ep epigraph uh, of one chapter from my uh, second autobiography, my university. Okay, when I was fifteen, I 
enter the University of Shandong as a student of mathematics. Uh, Shandong is the home province of uh, Confucian. I was born in, but I was born in Huangyan, a county of Zhejiang province on the coast of the southern China. Uh, it is 1,000 miles away from Shandong province, and I spend my uh, youth life in seven villages. My family, like most uh, at that time, didn't even own a TV or a bicycle. My mother was a primary and a middle school teacher, and my father was a high school headmaster, and later became a rightist, which means that he was considered the, an animal of communism and the people, and he worked on a farm. Uh, on the other side of our county. Partly for political reason, my father and my mother had separated. The day I was conce conceived might be the last day they made enough. Uh, that is how I describe the, their relation in my first autobiography, Little Memories, My Childhood in Most Time. In my adolescence, I often worked in the field, and even the mathematics textbooks were full of political slogans and quotations, quotations from Chairman Mao. However, when I was, not, I was lucky uh, that I was able to study at all. And uh, my elder brother, Wei Ming, was uh, in his first year of middle school when the Cultural Revolution started. All the schools and the university closed. He went to farm in northern eastern China in a remote village, which was five days away by bus and the train. It was a decade before he could return back home. I studied mathematics partly because my father, who studied history in university, thought that uh, the hard science were less political than the social science, and thus safer. My father died of stomach cancer when I was a sophomore, which means uh, 16 years old. He never knew that his youngest son finally became a poet and a writer, as well as a mathematician. I wrote my first poem when I was 20, and at that time I was a graduate student in number theory at Shandong University. On New Year's Eve 1984, I was walking back to my dormitory at midnight. After watching the New Year's celebration on TV at a professor's home, suddenly a beautiful girl rushed out from beneath the canopy of a tree and embraced me. Her face pressed against my chest. Then she looked up and realized that she mistaken me as her, as her boyfriend. <laughs> she was draw with disappointment. <laughs> I'd uh, never been so close with a young girl before. Uh, I couldn't sleep that night. And the next morning I wrote, the moment, and my roommate, who loved literature, told me, this is a poem. And that is my first poem, A Girl Under the Street Lamp. I revisit this story in my second autobiography, my university. Uh, these two autobiographies are published by the two most famous uh, Chinese publisher in Beijing. I never stopped writing since then. I write uh, poetry because I am curious. I write essays because, because I have questions. Uh, to live in the special society now and then, China is more or less isolated. Not only in ideology, but also in language, China is an old, strong, huge, stubborn, complex, and rich country. 
Though we don't have the complete freedom to write down our thoughts or publish our works, and we even don't have uh, Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> but we can. But we now we can think freely and uh, communicate with close friends. But be careful, since uh, unlucky things all still happen. I saw the slow crowded green chain for the first time on my way to university. But now the bullet chains and the highways are everywhere. It's uh, more convenient than USA. <laughs> the work I do with both mathematics and uh, my writing has allowed me to travel to every province in China and to over 100 countries more than any other Chinese writer in history. Each time I return to China without hesitation, since I write in Chinese, I think if you write in your own mother tongue, it means that you have inherited the greatest tradition. I have inherited classical Chinese poetry among the greatest, great classical poets of my tradition are uh, Li Bai, Du Fu, Bai Ju Yi, Wang Wei, Tao Qian. So when I consider creating in full view, my view is not only global view, but also a cross-disciplinary one. Our civilization has developed based on modern knowledge and tradition, but there is an important third source which has often been largely neglected. Interdisciplinary inference and uh, intercultural exchange. That is my interest as an ethicist. My focus is frequently on the interplay between science and the humanities, in particular, the common ground shared by mathematics, poetry, art, and daily life. We as writers and the creators need to have an, an accurate understanding of what we express in all areas to have some original and innovative ideas. I want to add, add something. As a poet, my interest is wider. It could be anything I see. It could be anything I see on the way and any experience in my life. I will end by sharing a quote from my article entitled Mathematician and the Poets, uh, which translated into at least seven languages in, and published, including uh, English, of course. Both mathematics and poetry are products of imagination. For a pure mathematician, his or her materials are like uh, lace work leaves on the tree, a patch of grass, or the night and the shadow on a person's face. Mathematics is like a true language which not only records and express ideas and the process of thinking, but also creates itself through poets and writers. It could be said that the mathematics and poetry are the freest intelligent intellectual activities. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Uh, before I start, my article was very long. I had a long battle with <laughs> Lee, <laughs> but she helped me. Thanks. And I will read the short version of it. My Swedish editor likens me to Cassandra. He describes me in my Swedish book as someone who carries in her soul the tragedy of sensing disasters, but not being able to stop or hinder them. That may be the summary of my adventure in poetry. In my childhood, I was curious about outer space. I used to look at the sky more than I looked at the people around me. 
Perhaps that explains why my neck is slightly uneven. I had the same curiosity and passion about what was happening beneath the earth. I decided to become an archaeologist. We have a lot to learn from the inscription on stones. The stone registers more than mankind. I wove my poetry in an interstitial space between the stone and the star. I am still doing it that way. My constant questioning about the sky and the subterranean made me more human. I become acquainted with the shared narratives of humanity because of that curiosity. I discovered the world of the great spirits who wrote the purest literature, the world of the writer that Lorca beautifully describes in his Duende. After all, an artist is nothing but someone who feels attraction between the earth and her, his body. Until now, I wrote dramatic poems in between the heavy reality of my people and that attractive force. But I have to confess, the older I become, the more I get interested in the philosophy of seeing joy as an integral part of thinking. I shall salute Socrates here. Well, until recently, I was living in the Highgate district of London. The tomb of Karl Marx was three minutes walking distance from my house. When I was there, George Michael died and was buried in the same graveyard. I found out via t Twitter that I was living in George Michael's neighborhood. Nowadays, we learn everything from Twitter. It seems that he lived in a secretive house with high walls, visible, the pub I, I sometimes used to frequent, Flask, where Lord Byron and Keats drank. At Flask, I used to meet my neighbor, Mark. He was a real nerd who prepared forecast reports for one of the most globally influential consulting firm. We usually talk about the future. When I asked him what will happen, he used to respond the same way. Listen, Bejan, we are all going to be vegetable. We're going to be cabbage. <laughs> to him, the biggest danger to the future of humankind was access to knowledge. A 12-year-old boy could access the knowledge to build an atom bomb via the internet, he said, and then, in the future, there will be generations who don't want to work, don't want to marry, don't want to have children, and who will stay dependent on their parents. Vegetable generations, you see. We are the generation that bridges the analog and the digital. We carry the reality of the past to the future. That is why we are tragic, but I will get to that. Before that, let us imagine for a moment what would happen if Cervantes lived today and sent his Don Quixote to his publisher. He would probably receive a letter from his editor saying, your work is too long. Please cut it short so that the reader is not bored. Sadly, that is the reality of our time. Our most important benchmark as writers is hooking the reader. The more the technology changes our relationship with speed, the shorter our attention span becomes. There is no old media anymore. Now the entities who produce news and images with higher frequency win. Truth or lie, there is too much information what we can say with certainty is that only its impact is true. Formerly, there was a monopoly on information. Because everybody can now produce information, it has no value anymore. Information is free of charge now. That is not bad, actually. Social media and technology offers possibilities of opening new areas of free speech. 
possibilities of fragmenting the power of authority. The problem is that the potential of fragmenting makes meaning and the truth also fragmentary. There is a flood of several truths. Which one is the right one? It is not only the form of truth that is changing in this climate. It is also, the, it is also its essence. Truth is something that can be simulated. We are producing emptiness, noise, and bubbles like air. Without any meaning or essence, we flow into an uncontrolled space of words, voices, and images we name post-truth. Let me give an example. A friend of mine, an actor, has been in a coma for four years. He wanted me to adopt Sophocles' Antigone. Like all his friends, I am waiting for the day of his awakening. I believe he will awaken and we will continue where we left off. Time and again, I see hashtags like Kenan Ushuk has awakened. One such hashtag was initiated when I was in Iowa. Twitter users wrote he was awake and even posted photos of his awakening. Because of the time difference between here and Turkey, I couldn't confirm the accuracy of the information. I couldn't sleep until morning because I was wildly happy. But unfortunately, it wasn't true. The truth of our time is like a soap bubble. What is said to be true is untrue, but its effects is true. We have to live and get used to it. Our feelings and our mind are in a boat on this stormy sea of subminal words and images. As you see, the human being as has capacity not only for light, but also for darkness. There is no escape from it. The flow of humanity and this history is in this direction. That is a stream no one can hinder, and it drags us. Where? To becoming vegetables? I hope it's not that way. I, with my Cassandra intuition, can say that we are getting closer to the light. Everywhere is brighter. Every day there is more energy emerging in the direction of a new dimension. And the whole, I mean we both, mankind and universe, is watching, watching it. The old world, old values, and old patterns we knew are crumbling, and new ones are replacing them. Nature abhors a vacuum. What kind of impact has the poem here now? I think that the poetry is one of the luckiest arts because the language of that new stream is poetry. Or it must be poetry. I want to believe it with all my heart because, honestly, our most urgent need today is to believe in something. The only way to overcome our rage is that conviction. As the poet said, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Thank you so much. Um, I want to open the room up to questions. Does anyone have a question for the group or an individual panelist? Um, Mr. Tietzin, Chai. Oh, yeah. uh, this week's and um, this week in um, the New Yorker, there was a nice long article on an author, a famous author in China called Yan Lianke. Yan Yan Y A N L I A N K E in English. Yan Yan J Y A N. How would that be in Chinese? Yang is his first name. I'm yeah. Sick. Well, maybe that's his last name. I don't oh. know. Uh, L I A N K E. L I A N A N K E. K E. Yang Ki. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Do you know of him? Huh? Which, what, 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 
Oh, I know him. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, uh, he, in that article, he had one very nice quote, which I want to repeat to you and see what you think. He said, in China, reality is so outrageous, it renders reality inert. Does that make sense to you? Uh, maybe you show me the word. Sorry. What, where, what is you? In China. Reality is so outrageous, and, uh, it renders reality inert. Is it, oh. I'm not so quite Anyone catch this one. Maybe you, I not, you, maybe you explain in a, in a uh, more. All right. I, I think uh, someone translated his, his work. In, uh, yes. His words, um, yeah. In China, yeah. the reality is yeah. so crazy. Yes, yes. That, ah. that uh, ah. it renders anything that's really true uh -huh. untrue. Basically, I, I, I can maybe I can understand you. <laughs> uh, I think it's a translating. Uh, she, she, he cannot uh, speak English. I think That's maybe right. yeah. I think. <laughs> so it's um, uh, much uh, abstract <laughs> than uh, what he expressed. I met him once in Cambridge. Uh, he's he's one of the uh, the the the, the writer more, now very famous after Moyen, I guess right. But before uh, ten, five years ago, he's not so famous. I think uh, he's from the province, very um, you know, with the most population and the very old, uh, and uh, with uh, four capitals. We have old uh, altogether eight capitals, but uh, four of them in his uh, province. So he's uh, it's quite a special place. And uh, my province is one of the uh, most developed one. So it's a more modern one. So I think there, in the, our experience, there are little difference. You know, he's uh, from very old one, and now uh, it's still poor province. So there's uh, something. Uh, he, 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 what he experienced is uh, uh, maybe different from, from me. I, I, can, I can understand him. But uh, in China, as I said, it's very a huge one, and uh, there are so many different uh, things in different places. So I, I didn't read uh, the, the article, but I can I, I imagine, and uh, I think he, he has his reason. Yeah, uh, is, my answer is uh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should read the article. Uh, yeah, I will uh, try to read the article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yesterday? No. Oh, it's, it's a special time now. <laughs> This question is for Eva. I wanted to ask you about your experience and the general experience of writers <coughs> as far as publishing in post-Soviet Georgia today. Can, can you say a little bit about that? Yes. First, what I want to say, uh, we post-Soviet guys don't like the term post-Soviet Union because we survived the Ottomans, the Parsian Empire, the Mongols, and Russians. So, it's not cool to call us like post-Mongol or post-Persian in <coughs> Georgia. So what is our experience? We have a couple of great publishing companies. And because of Frankfurt Book Fair, we have a connection in Europe, in Germany and UK. For example, my short story was translated in uh, United Kingdom in, and also in Germany. But I figured out that German book publishers have a terrible covers. I don't know why, but every book what was published there from Georgia is terrible cover is a little terrible. So we have some opportunities to be showing the to be more readable in the world now. Yeah, sorry, I don't figure out. Uh, I think many Georgian authors will break out after the Frankfurt Book Festival. So the, you will hear other Georgian authors name soon, I think. Thank you for question. So this is a question for you, Salah. Um, can you say anything positive about writers posting on Facebook? <laughs> uh, actually, I did. 
because the first part, the second paragraph, I'm talking about a very beautiful writer from Tunisia, Ayman Debussy, and uh, other talented writer, me, who posted his covers. I said that <laughs> I love covers, so <laughs> this is an other positive point. And uh, in the last paragraph of the first page, I said that uh, on the other hand, there are really good poets who publish. So there are not positive point about publishing on Facebook. Uh, th that's the question, so. Yeah, like, you know, do you get any feedback that is useful to you as a writer? So I will talk just for myself because I, I, I can't talk for everybody. I, I don't think that, uh, like, the feedback of on the comments uh, can help me because when I write something, I share it with uh, five or four friends, like close readers, and uh, they made a lot of notes and comments, but, like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm old uh, fashioned, but this, this comment about text, and especially when it's like raw materials, I don't think that uh, these comments or these notes can help me. But I'm sure that Facebook and all social media can change the, the length of the text, you know, because we have only the Americans who are writing 700 pages novels. I don't know why. Uh, so, <laughs> they create Facebook and they still write in very long books, so I wish they would stop that. But it's not good. No, Facebook is good, not, long books are not good. Yes, that's uh, the answer. I have a question for Bijan. I'm curious about where you see the light coming in. It's all about intuitions. <laughs> um, I'm, I can say I'm very spiritual and I see and I explain things in that context, usually, and I feel in that context. Mm. Compared to Middle Age, see the light. Mm -hmm. How much light we have now? Um, this is only a physical example. I don't know, I can say many things about that, but um, I think we are uh, close to kind of inner reality or truth more than before. And I don't know, it's long. I don't know how to explain. But uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You mentioned that still some unlucky things happen. Mm. What are what oh. would be an example <laughs> of an unlucky thing? <laughs> Uh, the most famous one is one, one of the most famous hosts on the TV. And he, when he uh, was dining with some friends, he made a joke of Mao Zedong. And someone put, uh, took the video and uh, put it on the WeChat. And then everyone saw it. He's joking of Mao Zedong and either Mao Zedong, and then he was removed to the, uh, the job. He lost his job. Uh, but still, some, you know, some um, boss, private boss, they, 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 they 
uh, he hired him. Now he got more pay than I guess, <laughs> but uh, despaired on the media. They, it means that you cannot joke, make any joke uh, of the um, present leader or the in the who he died. You can't make joke of the uh, the, the the communist leader. It's it, yeah, it's dangerous. It's, uh, so I, I think I want to uh, make a, a note that uh, I'm, I'm not afraid of something, but I just uh, think we need uh, the, the spirit of science, you know, in the way uh, the, the nation, we, uh, not only the, the new idea, but uh, in, in the, all the, in the long history of China, we are lack on, of science. Yeah, and in ancient time, we have, we have some great, good, uh, great uh, scientists, but uh, uh, in the past uh, fifth, 500 years, the, the, we have uh, we paid too attention to the emperors, so the, we don't study science uh, in the last 500 years. So I think I want to uh, tell them more the people that they want to say, this is now is okay, everyone here in the, the government uh, also think science is important. So I think if everyone has the spirit of science, then they will understand which rule or which system is better. So even as information is going up, we know that there is environmental degradation, you know, loss of landscapes and habitats. Um, so while we talk about Twitter being like a chirpy bird, we have loss of billions and billions upon billions of birds in the world. What does that do to poetry or poets? Do poets need birds at all or Twitter is fine? So, Paul. Oh, yes, yes. You go. <laughs> Me too. Can you repeat the question, please? You, you. Uh, okay, so. This metaphor about birds, excuse me. Yeah. It's about it's the tweets loss, loss or. Loss of birds, uh -huh. like loss of landscape. Uh -huh. What does it do to poetry? What does it do to poetry? To poetry. If you can have more Facebook posts or Twitter, uh -huh. which you've already. But I didn't talk about Twitter because they just gave us 140 letters to write. It's enough. It's it, it's not enough. So I didn't understand. Where the... does your imagination come from? Oh, you mean oh. So <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I, I, say, I think I get your question. You don't write poetry. Yeah, but I get the question. What what thing? <laughs> you know, uh, nowadays you you can leave your you can live in your cabinet or in a room and you can know everything about the world mm -hmm. so uh, every you can get something from the facebook and on this uh, on this situation the facebook and social media and other sites really help me to get some more information because i'm too lazy to go somewhere to do my research and i'm doing everything from in the, from the internet yeah. it helps mm. yeah uh, well, i get uh, inspiration or image through my travels my tour, the travelers, well, yeah, yes, yes, travelers, yes, yes. Also, um, books, readings, yes, and the conversations between the the words. Um, <laughs> social media language, as Salah said, 140 characters, that short. People are looking for a very intensive, uh, concrete. Uh, sentences, which is poetry most of the time. Uh, I see poetry like that. You can write a novel, like 700 pages, but you can tell this in two lines with poetry. Poetry has this capacity, this potential. Uh, that's why the language of our time, social media, is very close to this saying, poetic uh, language and uh, talking about inspiration inspiration I believe my most of the artists get the inspiration from nature the root is inspiration is in nature 
But through Twitter, this is like more like involving. We are uh, circulating in this stormy sea, as I said before. Um, actually, um, it cuts your uh, concentration. This is the bad part of it, the worst part of it. Uh, I start, I always write by hand. Uh, when I had my first computer, I was around my late 20s. And now I have iPhone. When I walk, I write poetry usually. I used to carry my notebook and my pen with me to sit somewhere and write the inspiration I got from the nature. But sometimes, because poetic um, inspiration, poetry and inspiration is very, uh, it's a kind of shamanistic ritual for me, with iPhone, I record what I feel and what I say. It's more synchronized. This helps also. It's, it's an advantage for a poet. In the old times, because when you sit to write, you, 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 you lose your inspiration a bit. There is a gap between the time you sit. Uh, that's why it has the be a good part and the bad part effect. Uh, uh, but I deeply believe um, on Facebook post, Twitter, Instagram, the language become more, more poetic for everyone who use social media. They are looking. I see my poetry, for example. They share. It, by midnight, at one of the Twitter users, he sit in his room, which I don't know him. I never met him. But to give a message, he use my poetry. And they need a poetic kind of meaning to express themselves. If I can add just something, because I'm OK with the, the, the concrete sentences in the social media. But I think, the, as I said in the paper, that the post in social media, especially in Facebook, it, it is challenging the poetry today. because. I have a lot of friends who are writing very beautiful posts on Facebook. It's not poetry or prose. Uh, they put like the, ane the anecdotes, the juxt juxtapositions. They put very small formats in very little space. And uh, it's a fragment. And in the Arabic world, with the free line, like the new modern poetry, people used to do that in the 90s in poetry. And you, you can't do it anymore because it's on Facebook now. So you, you need to, 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 to create something new because people can do it just on Facebook. And it's funny, and it's speed, and it's fast. So if you want to, to, uh, to push the inspiration, even if I don't know what what's exactly this word means, but if you want to push it to the extreme, you need to, uh, to challenge this post on Facebook or Twitter. All right, I want to thank all of the panelists. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming to our event today. Um, I believe there's still food and coffee and drinks in the back, so please help yourself. And feel free to chat as well. Thank you so much.